So I'm going to take you back to about 255 million years ago in the Karoo. Uh, it's just one of the real time slices that uh, I know a lot about. And uh, it is one of the time slices that is uh, right in the middle of the prospecting area for fracking in the southern Karoo. Okay. <coughs> 250 million years ago, the Karoo was part of southern Gondwana, and southern Gondwana was actually joined to all the northern continents at that time in the supercontinent of Pangaea. The area there in red is, uh, it covers the Karoo, southern Karoo area, and that is uh, the, the sort of geographic position of it. Uh, at the time, I'm going to be reconstructing an ancient ecosystem equally as, uh, as diverse and equally as fragile as that of the Karoo today. The Karoo rocks uh, um, uh, cover about two-thirds of the land surface of South Africa, so they're not insignificant in terms of, of our, our landscape. Uh, and the ages of those rocks are, uh, are more significant in terms of the uh, periods of time that they are uh, dealing with between 300 and 200 million years ago, which is the time in geological history when... Uh, when mammals evolved and uh, uh, mammals originated uh, from, uh, from the reptiles through this phase called the mammal-like reptiles into true mammals and the origin of the earliest dinosaurs. The evidence for all of that, for one of the best, in fact the best collecting areas for that evidence, are the rocks of uh, the, the Great Karoo. In terms of the, uh, the, um, the connection between the continental drift of, 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 uh, of the coming together of Pangaea and the, the coalescence of all the continents at the single time in, in geological history, around 250 million years ago, the, uh, there was a, a world which is very different to today's, uh, uh, but it had its own problems, it had its own pressures of having all the continents on one side of the globe and just open ocean on the other. What were those problems? What, what were those ecosystems like? That's my job to find out, and I go to the Karoo to find the evidence of what life and times was like at that uh, 252 million year mark, and which also marks the point at which the Earth suffered its largest mass extinction ever. The end Permian mass extinction, over 90% of terrestrial families of groups of, of, of terrestrial organisms went extinct at that time, at, at, as well as over 99% in the ocean. So there was this extreme global extinction uh, such that we have never experienced since at that time, and we want to know how it happened and what the kill mechanisms were. The 255 million year uh, um, level, uh, which we're now going to go out into the crew to have a look at, uh, really is uh, summed up by the uh, evolutionary phylogenists uh, this sort of way, where the more primitive animals are at the bottom and the more advanced animals at the top, and this is of course today. So some of the uh, groups that we have around in the Karoo today have their origins way back uh, at this time. So it's looking at the origins of mammals in particular, which is this line here, this, this particular little uh, connection here, which happened in the earliest Triassic, was, uh, is recorded in our Karoo Basin, and that is the origin of mammals. So that is well, what we're world famous for. The uh, radiation of the dinosaurs is also recorded there, uh, um, and, and the, the survivors of the mass extinction, which lead to uh, our present uh, day ecosystems, can be studied at this uh, 252 mark. That, that mark there, right there, and I've done about 10 or 15 years' work to research on that particular incident. So the origin of mammals, I just, uh, the, the, my, my job here today is really to show you the wonder that is sitting in the rocks of the Karoo. I'm not making any major statements about fracking, except to, to suggest to you that the rocks of the Karoo are underestimated in terms of their value, their, their paleontological value, their paleontological heritage. So there's a, a, just a, a, a series of uh, beautiful uh, 
the skulls of animals that show the evolution from a reptilian type of form through a mammal-like reptile form with, uh, and we've concentrated on the carnivores because it's through the carnivores that we get to our first uh, true mammal. And the localities there you see are through the fracking area up in, and into to the, to the north of our Karoo Basin. That first true mammal fossil looked like that. So uh, you have uh, solace in the fact that uh, your ancestors, your direct, uh, um, uh, your distant mammalian ancestor uh, has, uh, e has evidence, uh, fossil evidence from the Karoo. And this is the, uh, these are the beautiful um, uh, cusped teeth, of the po uh, post canine teeth of a rodent like. Uh, mammal, but that's the first mammal that shows all the mammalian characteristics from which all current mammals have evolved. I too, of course, uh, having lived and worked in the Karoo for 40 years, I'm a Karoo addict. I have absolutely, uh, there's no place else I would rather work than the Karoo, mainly because of its landscape. And I like this, uh, my, 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 um, Physical landscape is the thing that turns me on, not necessarily the cultural landscape, although that, of course, has a lot to do with why I like it so much. The physical landscape, of course, is where I do my research. And the, uh, the rocks of the Karoo, or what makes up the physical landscape, are mainly sandstones, which form these little uh, ledges, and there are uh, mud rocks or, or clay stones in between, and uh, it's in the clay stones that I find most of my fossils. If I go into a satellite, go to Google Earth, and look down on the escarpment right there near Beaufort West, near uh, south of Fraserburg, uh, you will see these beautiful uh, uh, evidence of the former windings of the ancient rivers that used to flow through the Karoo from the south towards the north, Mississippi-sized rivers. And these are meandering rivers uh, that uh, are so different to the, uh, the sorts of... of um, rivers that you get today, which of course are these tiny little ephemeral streams. These are massive Mississippi-sized rivers that lay down the rocks of the Karoo. And of course, uh, it's below this uh, particular interval that, uh, that the hydrocarbons are stored in the, uh, in the, in the White Hill Formation beneath this. Looking at the uh, details of these uh, images, you can, uh, uh, a geomorphologist can put together the different environments of the ancient uh, floodplains on which the uh, plants and animals lived and, of course, became uh, fossilized in the mudstones of the, uh, uh, the layer upon layer of overbank or, or, or uh, floodplain muds that uh, accumulated. And it's on these floodplain muds that the animals lived and their bones are found in this Material. So this is the natural outcrop of anywhere you walk in any part of the southern Peru, and uh, you will uh, um, you will be able to see the bones just weathering out of of the uh, of these mud rocks. We have no quick way of finding them. We look and walk and walk and look and uh, do it for a long time. Uh, this is this is a particular uh, one that I just want to show you how how it how it looks. We, we will look at these outcrops and say, that no, that's pretty good. Let's go and have a closer look. Uh, this is uh, uh, the fossil as it was found. This is, the, in fact, the uh, left orbit of the skull. That's the back of the skull and some postcranial, uh, some uh, backbone sticking out there. This is the fossil that's on display in Karoo Disclosure. It's the one, uh, one of the ones in that case. Uh, it's a dwarf pariasaur. It's very rare, extremely rare. In fact, this is only the third one ever found in 150 years of collecting. And you're seeing it coming out of the rock. So for you, even though if you're not a paleontologist, you can actually get the feeling that there's something more to these rocks than, than just, uh, net, net, uh, uh, just shale. You know? so it's, there's, there's stuff in it, and the stuff is signs of, of life of 255 million years ago. So taking the... Taking more of a, oh, sorry. Taking uh, more of the shale away, we'll start to uncover these skeletons in the rock that's now being excavated. And a closer look, even there out in the field, will show the uh, body of this animal is covered in um, bony scales, bony scutes called osteoderms. It was a most peculiar type of reptile. 
Uh, that's how we take them out. Uh, I've used um, plaster bandages that uh, you usually use in hospitals for making casts of legs. That's a, a very proliferous size of animal, ideal type of uh, jacket. Uh, Georgina here working on the, the skull of what we nicknamed it Gordon because Gordon was the owner of the farm um, north of Boca West. Have you been there? It's, it's always good to, uh, to uh, acknowledge that. Uh, it didn't yield any sponsorship if you like, <laughs> but it was, it was good. So, so there is now, the, after Georgina spent about uh, uh, six months working on it, drilling up all the, all the, the shale from the, uh, from the skull, you can see now the two eyes, and this hole in the center of the skull, it's the pineal foramen, it is its ancient temperature detector. So we, uh, we have no longer got the pineal foramen, although as infants we have this Fontanella, and uh, that is our ancestral uh, evidence of that we did come through this type of animal to get to where we are today. So that is a dwarf parias or nanoparia. Another type of animal that you will find out they're very common are the small herbivorous animals. These are the base herbivores, the ancient dassies of the Karoo. And this is what it looks like if you are looking for them. And it's quite subtle, of course. There's the left orbit, and there's the snout, and there's the, the canonical process, and the lower jaw. Uh, that's a much more uh, obvious one. Of course, this is so obvious because uh, National Geographic asked me to position it where I found it. So it's a, it's a slightly contrived uh, uh, photograph. Uh, but what we found out about this animal is they were living in underground burrows. And here's one that we've just been researching. It's still hot off the press. It hasn't been published yet, but you're getting a close uh, look at, at uh, this burrow cast. You know, this is like, you've got to imagine this was a hole in the ground, and it's been filled, naturally filled with silt and sand. And there at the bottom is uh, a fossil. And when we excavated it, uh, uh, when we excavated and prepared it out here, then the animal that was in this burrow is uh, this animal, Diectodon. So there's a fleshed up reconstruction of what we think this animal looked like and is sitting in its burrow 255 million years ago. And another specimen lying in the rock as it was found, this is the back end of the skull, that's where it joins onto the spine, that's uh, uh, the skull, and that's what it looks like now. Beautiful, even if you can't appreciate their value to science, they are certainly, certainly worth uh, uh, objects worth preserving. Uh, much more uh, um, articulated material. This has also just come out of the Karoo. It's going to come on display. It's, it is the second, it is the most articulated specimen of its kind, and only the second skeleton of this has ever been found. And it'll look like that. And um, we will go. There are other things about uh, the, the, the fossils. They're not all just the bones of the, uh, of the skeletons. We find their droppings as well. And here is some, some fossil droppings called coprolites, where we can find what the animal was eating and what was being eaten, as well as their footprints. There's uh, something very uh, useful about footprints like this, which are uh, next near Fraser Bird, which are right in that tracking area. Right, uh, uh, luckily, the uh, Sutherland Observatory might give it some immunity, but uh, nevertheless, it's still in a sensitive site that uh, these footprints are very rare, but show how the animals were walking. There's no doubt that they are ancient footprints, and we can now reconstruct using high tech to, to find out how the animals were walking. So, so in a very unique way, we can find out not only what the animals were doing, how they were interacting, how they, what their ecosystems were like, uh, the animals and the plants. We even can place them right down on their trackways where they walked 255 million years ago with some certainty, not, not, uh, not with such imagination, that, uh, so as with some scientific certainty. So uh, they, I think the, 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 my, my uh, parting shot would be to show you how I envisage the rocks of the Karoo and how I envisage the Karoo region around Fraserburg 255 million years ago, and tell you that this is a, a very uh, uh, exciting ecosystem which is hardly scratched. We have hardly looked at what uh, the ecosystems of the past were like in the Karoo, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it, I just want to make you aware that there's more to those rocks than meets the eye. Thank you very much.